Hello, everybody. Welcome to Tea Time at the Seminary. Now, right now, we are in New York with Father Damien. Thank you so much for coming on for the show today. Very pleased. Okay. So, Father Damien, um, what kind of tea do you typically drink? Uh, raspberry. Raspberry. Okay. So, we're actually we're going to be drinking raspberry tea right now. And while we're drinking it, I'm going to be having a conversation with you. We're going to have a little bit of a talk about your life. So, what's your story, really? I mean, what is, what is your story, and how did you find Orthodoxy and uh, the Genuine Orthodox Church? Well, I was raised in a very pious Catholic family. Um, I have, a, on my mother's side, a background Hungarian. They were tenant farmers, very poor. Um, and they came to America to have a better life. And also because communism was beginning to come into Hungary at the time. Um, the First World War had ended and there were uh, people from, you know, Russian, um, side who were, wanted to come into the village. And my, I remember my grandfather telling me how they were extremely anti-communist uh, and they were very believing Catholics. And they took up arms literally to prevent Russian soldiers from kind of melting into the local village. And on my father's side, I'm um, Norwegian and Danish. Um, and they were very pious Lutherans. Um, my father became Catholic only with the baptism of the fourth child. And um, he and my mother both, till their death, were very believing and practicing Catholics. Um, I went through Catholic grammar school with the nuns. They were all traditional. They were from the 1800s, actually. Um, I went to St. Peter's Prep in Jersey City, New Jersey and St. Peter's College in Jersey City, New Jersey. At one point, both what became the prep and the college were like the uh, gymnasium of Europe. It was, it was six years of study. And it divided into, um, you know, the uh, present state of um, four years of high school and then four years of college. All through high school and college, I had very, very traditional priests um, in college, even I had priests who were um, teachers of my uncles who went to St. Peter's College. And it's a, kind of an interesting note that um, when the college first started as a college, my great uncle, after whom I'm named, who intended to be a Catholic priest, um, he was hazed. Um, his sister, my grandmother, my mother's mother, was going by in a bus and saw what was taking place. They literally, because he wouldn't fight back, they were jumping up and down upon him. And they actually, uh, basically in the end, caused his death because they crushed his groin. His name was Stephen. And um, the old, being you know, wanting to be a priest, he had to be a whole man. You, you had to have all your body parts. And the only thing that would save his life would be surgical castration. And he absolutely refused. And I remember my great-grandmother, his mother, talking to me about this. And she was so upset uh, with her son in the hospital and him wanting to be a priest. And, you know, how could God let this kind of thing happen? And, you know, he said, Mom, if I'm, I want to be a priest, if I'm going to be a priest, then it's God's will. He'll heal me and I'll be a priest. And if not, I will die. And it's that. And Mom, remember something. You don't argue with God because you're not going to win anyway. So he did die. And when I came along, I was named after him. In the Roman tradition, uh, you don't receive confirmation with baptism like an orthodoxy. You, you receive confirmation, um, a chrismation, when you are about 11 years old. Well, um, when, and you take a second name then. And of course, being 
uh, yourself living and breathing, you can choose a name. Well, I chose the name of Joseph as my second name. So I was Stephen Joseph. Well, we would go to the cemetery on, not uh, Pascha, but on Palm Sunday to avoid the crowds. And we'd go from, you know, uh, grave to grave praying. And I, when we got to Uncle Stephen's grave, all of a sudden I noticed that his middle name was Joseph. And I didn't really know that, was aware of it. But somehow I chose his name. And as would turn out later, as I said to my parents when I became into orthodoxy, I says, well, I guess I'm fulfilling his desire to be a priest by becoming an orthodox priest. At any rate, um, when I got out of college, um, my college deferment, there was a draft at the time. It was the um, war in Vietnam. And um, the teacher, there, was no, there were no jobs available uh, for me. I was licensed in Jersey to teach English, Latin, and German, and there was nothing available. So my mother found out that the fourth grade teacher in the school that I went to and the school that my mother and her siblings went to, there was an opening for a fourth grade teacher. So I went and I spoke with the mother superior. And... Um, there were two fourth grades, and because of my background with 16 years of church school, um, she, the, the mother superior wanted me to teach the religion to both fourth grades. And I made a promise. She asked me, please stay the year. Many people would come because they couldn't find a job in a public school. They would go to a parochial school, and then something opened up, and they would leave in the middle of the year. A, because the, the public schools gave more money, twice, as a matter of fact. So uh, I was the highest paid teacher because I had college already, and I was paid $5,000 a year. A public school at the time paid ten. But I promised the nun that I would stay the year. It's unbelievable how the decisions in a person's life, whatever you decide about important things, and perhaps not so important, sets up a whole series of consequences based upon what you actually decide to do or not to do. Just before the school year began, I became aware, my mother had a call, that um, there was an opening in some public school for what I was um, licensed to teach. And I called back, and the woman asked me, I said, well, I already have a job. Well, where is it? It's St. Augustine's Roman Catholic Parochial School. Oh, Catholic school. They don't pay very much. Uh, how much? 5000 Well, we'll give you 10 I promised that I would... I made a promise to a person representing God, a nun, who has devoted herself to God. I promised that I would stay the year. And, of course, she told me I was crazy, you know, whatever. But I, the way that I was brought up, when you give your solemn word, you keep it. Now, in retrospect, had I gone to the other job in a public school, I would have been in a completely secular, non-religious environment. And I was a young man, prey to all the temptations that are, temptations that are out there. And I, if, if I do wind up finding salvation, the decision to stay and teach in that Catholic school will be a very big part of what will happen in my life. So teaching two classes of religion, two hours each day I taught religion. And having been taught for 16 years, I certainly knew the Catholic faith. And when you teach something for a few hours a day, it becomes more real to you. And so my, my Catholic faith, which was always there, was, was reinforced. And had I gone to the public school, I shudder to think of what might have happened. The world would have sucked me in. I'm sure of it. And while teaching there for four years, I was becoming aware that, like, 
the nuns, they, changed, they were taking off their religious garb. One of the nuns who was there when I was in the grammar school, she was very young then, told me that she didn't believe in hell. How could a God of love put anyone in hell? And I said, but sister, this is the te- you're calling yourself a Catholic and the church teaches this. Are you going to tell me that Adolf Hitler and, and, and um, uh, you know, St. Francis of Assisi, for instance, are in the same place right now? She had no answer for me. And then speaking with priests, there, was, there seemed to be this like, well, they'll pick and choose what they really believe, and they really don't believe the Pope is, is infallible and all this. It really started making me question, what the heck is going on? I thought, you know, God is in heaven, and everything was all right with the church. Furthermore, um, my older brother, who was the first child, after um, a year of college in Boston, he went into the Jesuit seminary. And at some point a few years later, not only did he leave the seminary, he left Christianity and became a Scientologist. Well, which was a complete disgrace in the family, and we couldn't understand how this could possibly happen. And uh, I, by teaching religion, I started to feel a vocation. But I certainly wasn't going to go into a Jesuit seminary. And I prayed and I prayed, you know, Lord, show me what you want me to do. And the only answer I got was that I would have to wait and God would show me. Well, as as time went on, one day um, I came across two Orthodox priests who had been seminarians in my own diocese in New Jersey and had I gone into the, to the uh, secular priesthood, uh, not the monastic priesthood, I would have been in the seminary that they were in. So we started a conversation, and I didn't really know much about orthodoxy at all. And um, at one point, after talking and visiting and whatever, they took me to their Ukrainian bishop in the Bronx, Archbishop Volodymyr Profeta. And I'll I'll never forget that night when I met him and I was taken into the church. Now, this was a a Dutch Reformed church from the 19th century. The Ukrainians had bought it and made it a, a, a beautiful Orthodox church. It was magnificent. As a matter of fact, it was so beautiful that the the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art wanted to take that dismantle it and put it in a suburban setting as a museum. That's what the iconography was like in there. Well, going into that church, it was physically cold because there was no heat on. But with all my prayers over the course of years, I felt something in there. I felt what ultimately everything comes down to, and that is love. And love, God is love, according to St. John. And that's what it all begins with, and that is what it all goes back to. So I started going there, and um, I, at some point, I was a a tonsured uh, Rastafor monk and was um, ordained a priest. I didn't even want uh, priestly ordination. I begged the archbishop not to ordain me because uh, I I had a sense of the awesome responsibility that went with this, and uh, I I didn't feel worthy. I only wanted to be a simple monk in a monastic situation, working around the monastery and at prayer. A hidden, humble life. But things didn't work out that way. My late archbishop um, had a crusade against communism. And um, at one point, uh, a priest, Father Robert, he said, I, we have to do an errand for the archbishop. You need to come with me. I'm not to do this alone. 
So we went to Bridgeport, Connecticut, and a father pulled in to a parking space, and he pointed down the road. He said, do you see that Russian church there? The priest there is very high KGB. Now, I'm going over to such and such a store to get information for the archbishop. If I'm not back in half an hour, go down to the police and, and call Vladika. He gets out of the car and goes to that to, to get this information. And I'm just sitting in this car and it's like, what is this? I'm a kid from Jersey. I'm, I'm in what, international espionage? Now, the archbishop, because of his crusade against communism, many attempts have been made on his life because he had pictures, he had pictures from the State Department of the United States showing things like the Catania Forest Massacre. I saw these movies. Uh, you couldn't watch this without being led to tears. Humongous piles of dead priests and nuns and soldiers. It, it, was just, it was just unbelievable what people who are in league with Satan can do in this world. And the Archbishop would rent theaters all across, all up and down the Eastern Seaboard, showing these films to wake people up in, in America as to the real threat that communism was. Because communism all the way back was infiltrating in this country. Well, thank God the priest came back. We went down to the, to, back to the Bronx. And, and the archbishop t took this information. Within 48 hours, our car was being sabotaged. We went out every day seeking donations. We had like a soup kitchen. We collected clothing and food and, uh, and articles. And there were people knocking on the door every single day. Well, within 48 hours of the bishop handing in this information, uh, the car was rigged when we would travel to get donations. The car was rigged that a tire would blow or something would happen with the motor. Um, and this happened five days consecutively. And at one point, it's a miracle that we weren't killed in an accident when the tire blew. And every day, the car wound up in the repair shop. And after five days of this, Vladika said, Father Damien, where, again, where is Father Robert? Well, you know, probably with the car. What is this with the car for five days straight? And then it dawned on him. You hand in one more name, and they started all over again, those commie bums. Well, that was in the middle of the summer of 72. Uh, he was no longer showing these films, but he still worked with people high in the government fighting communism. And one night, he, um, he had chest pain. He, he had a bad heart. And um, we called 911, and they came to take him to the hospital. And he said, don't you realize that if I go to the hospital, I will be dead for sure by morning. We weren't thinking what he really meant. Uh, I had gone to bed, exhausted. And the next morning, I realized that he wasn't there. And the phone rang to announce to us that uh, he was found dead that morning. Uh, it was a very big funeral. He was to be buried with his father, who was... Profeta was the 12th generation of priests in his family. And they were orthodox. They were not uniate at all. And his belief was truly orthodox. And uh, the funeral was on... Uh, it's during the week. There were priests at the funeral who had gone to another diocese, but who came out of respect to the funeral. The funeral, the, the burial was going to be with his family in uh, South Plainfield, New Jersey. 
and a very large funeral cortege started out. These two priests, who had been in his jurisdiction, wanted a copy of a book that was printed by the MP. So after the funeral, they go and they knock on the door. They go down to Manhattan and they knock on the door of the Russian cathedral. And who answers the door dressed as a priest but a man who one hour before was standing next to them at the funeral dressed in lay clothes. And the two priests and the priest who answered the door were quite shocked to see one another. And the two priests from the funeral, who had been priests of Propheta, said, we, didn't we just see you at the archbishop's funeral? Yes. And he makes this comment. Well, you know, we were determined to shut him down, intimating that they had shut him down. Within weeks of the funeral, all the clergy were uh, put at gunpoint on the street. We went to the district of the uh, attorney. We got a lawyer. The money that was in the bank not only did it disappear, but all the records of the accounts. And I used to prepare text for the archbishop to sign. And everything disappeared. Uh, so literally, we monastics were on the street, going to my parents' home or people's relatives and whatever. But I, I always remembered what P Propheta said, boys, when I die, run for the hills, the dam she is busted. And, well, I did wind up in the hills here. But it was a long time before that could actually come to be. Um, towards that end, the end of that summer, uh, one day Profeta wanted to have a good long talk with me. He said, you know, Father, we are, people don't think we're really orthodox, but I, I want to really show to you that we are. And he took out Isabel F. Hopgood's book, and we went through the service for the consecration of the bishop, all the professions of faith and whatever. And discussing all this, um, uh, at the end of the discussion of the, of the dogma, uh, he said, you see, Father, we really are orthodox, but you have to understand something else. Uh, when I'm not here anymore, when people come especially for the Episcopate, you really have to interrogate them to make sure that their faith is orthodox. They are not to read at their consecration. They are not to read from a book the professions of faith. They must put it in their own handwriting. They must read that manuscript at the consecration. After reading it, they are to go to the holy table, to the altar itself, and sign it on the altar. And that stays, the original stays here in the cathedral. They can take a copy. We are orthodox. Well, with that understanding, here we are literally on the street. I went back to teaching. I started to earn some money. And I was convinced that if I had to, I was going to buy a piece of land. And if I had to, I'd pitch a tent someday. But when I made that promise, I never realized that's how, that's how I was going to get started up here. So uh, we didn't have the church. Uh, I was in, I was in um, New Jersey. Um, I had a small group coming to church. Um, and it, God brought it about that... Um, there was a chapel in New York that was the last chapel of some small group. And it was a, there, a bishop who had been one of Prophet's uh, consecrators, but he was not really orthodox in his belief. But his, 
His historical connection was to a church, uh, a synod that was founded um, uh, following a plan that Patriarch Tikhon had to have an indigenous American Orthodox jurisdiction. Uh, the primate of that small group was Artemios Ufish. Then there was Joseph Zuk, who was Ukrainian. Zafaronius Bashira, I think, was Syrian. Uh, and then there was an American that was made titular bishop for uh, Washington, D.C. Um, with the confusion with the revolution, um, the, the Greeks kind of saw their opportunity to kind of take over what was a canonized diocese of, of the Russian church. And um, that this fledgling jurisdiction was given no recognition. So it basically became extinct with the exception of one a bishop. And uh, he later proved to be not orthodox, but um, he had made uh, some Protestant Episcopals into supposedly orthodox clergy. And Profeta had an organization, an organization called the, um, oh, it was a, um, a service league for uh, churches that poor clergy could get discounted um, medical, um, legal help, dental, whatever. And many people came into that. It was not strictly for the Orthodox only. So many people came into that, and by that became part of Profeta's jurisdiction. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, it, it all fell apart. And so here I am, and I'm coming to this once a month. I'm coming to this church to do um, Orthodox services. And um, at a certain point, even though we were kind of in exile, uh, remaining bishops of Profeta's jurisdiction uh, made me bishop. Um, and the only reason I accepted it was because I was in the Bronx and I knew who wasn't, wasn't, wasn't part of the jurisdiction. Profeta committed the sin of ordaining many people he should never have ordained. And he realized that, but it was too late. And after his death, there seemed to be people coming like roaches out of the woodwork who were claiming to have orders from him and who are absolute, complete, and total frauds. So I wanted to set the story straight, and I always had the faith that Profeta was uh, validly a, a priest and bishop. Um, I never had any doubts of that. And I knew that at some point... I would have to get myself into some proper jurisdiction, but I had no idea what that would be. Well, this place where I served once a month, people who lived up here in, invited um, people up to um, for a picnic the, the weekend after Labor Day. I think it was the year of 74. And when I came up the hill, and I saw this setting, I said, what a beautiful place for a monastery. So, uh, you know, the people in there, the elderly couple, they said, could you really do that? And I had the authority from Profeta's jurisdiction to, to establish a place wherever I saw fit. And so we started to talk about buying land. And as I was working, teaching again, I was gathering money, and so I purchased 10 acres which is how I got started up here. Well, I came up in July of 83. I had come up earlier uh, working at a local resort, a local store. I mean, um, notwithstanding what my supposed title was, uh, I was humbling myself to work, to get started. I had to start literally from scratch, from nothing. And people had said, what are you going to do up there? How are you going to make a living? What are you going to do? I said, I don't know. Christ said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all else will be given to you. Do I believe that or don't I? So I came up and I pitched, I pitched my tent. 
Uh, when I was up here earlier in the late 70s, I even worked at a local supermarket. And just one of the many miracles that have happened, I was on the night shift. We had a blizzard. We were let go early because the food didn't come in the trucks. I come in the beginning of Pucker Street. I cannot see anything. We have a white out. And I'm, I don't even know where I am on Pucker Street. And I see a deer in the, in the lights. I swerve to avoid it. And I go off the road. I get stuck. I get out. I take a flashlight. And I walk all the way up. I was renting a room in the farmhouse across the road. So in the morning, I call my um, mechanic. His name was John. He was a Baptist, so he was my friend, John the Baptist. <laughs> and I called him, and I said, John, you know, I'm stuck. You know my car. You work on it, so I don't know where it is. But please pull me out from the ditch. So I get a ride down, and before we get to the car, I can see my mechanic looking at something, and his face is absolutely white as a ghost. And when I get up closer, I see where my car is. I had gone off the road where there was a bridge with no side rails. The rear wheels were on the ground. From the rear wheels to the front bumper, which was hanging in a tree coming up from the side of a creek, the rest of the car was literally hanging in midair. Now, how the heck did I get out of the car and walk? Even if the car had been on dry land when I got out of the car, had it slid, it would have gone right down into the creek. And here is a car with rear wheels on the ground, and the rest of the car is literally hanging in the air. So my car mechanic, by the way, whose nephew is a monk at Jordanville, uh, saw this. And this is just one of many things where it just wasn't my time to go. So um, when I came up in, in, you know, 83 and pitched the tent, um, my first meal, I had gotten permission from these people to plug a hot plate into the sheep barn which doesn't exist anymore. So uh, pardon me for how this has to be phrased, but I was stirring my oatmeal mush in a pot on the hot plate, standing in two plus feet of sheep manure, my first meal here. And I thought to myself, you have to be out of your cotton picking. What the heck are you doing here? You work, this is why you went to college, for goodness sakes? You're standing in this sheep manure, and this is what you're eating? Well, I got over that. And I'm certainly not stirring you know, that anymore in a, in, a, in a sheep barn in manure. But that's what, that was the beginning of this place. And... Uh, it, it just happened then that um, uh, I only had a couple of days work in the city every other week cleaning. And these people went back and forth to the city. So I got a ride from them. I did my work and back up here. I had an income at that point of $60 a month. Um, my meals were... Oatmeal, oatmeal, and five days a week, uh, liver for supper because I have health issues. And on fast days, it was oatmeal, oatmeal, and oatmeal. I ate acorns and hickory nuts. And that was how it, how it began. But as time went on, there was work up here. I didn't go back to the city. My father was going to get another car, and I had a car. And so things went on. So I was up here for going on, you know, into the 10th year. And I was being visited by people from a roll corps parish in Connecticut, two young men. And they would visit me and stay for a few days. And they always, before they went back to Connecticut, they would visit Jordanville and go to the bookstore and whatever. And they were trying to get me to go with them to Jordanville. And I said, one day, one day, 
after all, I'm like the bastard child of orthodoxy. You know, Jordanville, with its reputation, wouldn't even look at me. Well, my brother, who was a doctor, moved my elderly parents to California uh, uh, to be close to them, to help them in their old age. And um, these two fellows who used to come all the time, they said, you know, uh, in Reading, there is this local mission parish. So why don't you, this is the phone number of the priest, call them when you visit your parents, go to see them. So I did. I gave a call and um, I went to a liturgy there in this mission parish. And the, the, the owner of the property um, was Valentina Harvey, and she had been... In, in China with Vladika John and came to the United States with him. And here she was in Northern California and Vladika John would visit her all the time and whatever. Um, and she, she had from Vladika John vestments and such. And she gave me a piece of the coffin and material of Vladika John's clothing. So I visited this parish and lo and behold, the services were actually in English. And I thought, wow. So when I explained where I was from to Father Philip, he mentioned me to uh, Vladika Hilarion. And Vladika Hilarion, of course, everybody knew who Archbishop Profeta was. And so he said to, uh, uh, to uh, Father Philip, the next time you see us speak to Father Damien, tell him that I would be happy to meet with him and talk with him. Well, I got the message and I had no intention of seeing him at all. You know, I thought, no one's going to look at me. So, this, these two boys, they got me to commit that the next time they came, I would go to them, uh, to Jordanville for a visit. Um, my return trip to New York was delayed because of an illness in the family. And so... When I came back and we went to Jordanville, it just turned out that this was the big uh, feast of St. Job of Pachayef, who uh, is the patron of their printing. And we arrive and there are buses from Canada and all over. And they, these young men look at me and say, you know, we come here and everything is locked up. You come here for the first time and we have Cecil B. DeMille production. So we go into the church, and there are two Vladigas serving. And I ask one of these boys, is one of the bishops Bishop Hilarion? Yes, yes. And he pointed the one out. So at the end of the service, I wait outside, and as Bishop Hilarion is coming out, I get his blessing, and I say, Vladiga, I'm Father Damon. Oh, you're, you're from Prophetess Jurisdiction. Yes. He says, is there anything left of that jurisdiction? I says, yes, you're looking at it. I, I'm, I basically, I was the last one. Everybody went elsewhere. One went to Rocor immediately. Some went to the OCA, whatever. So I was the last. He says, well, why don't you join us? I was shocked. I mean, I'm standing in the doors of the cathedral in Jordanville, and I'm being asked, you know, this nothing is being asked to join Rocor, uh, I was ecstatic. And so, as it turned out, um, because I was only received by Bishop uh, Profeta by chrismation, if they were going to uh, regularize my situation, and if I ever wanted to go to um, uh, Mount Athos, and they asked how I was received originally, uh, they wouldn't be happy with chrismation. So the synod... Um, decided that I would have to start with baptism. And Bishop Hilarion uh, called me and said, would you do this? And I said, Vladika, however it has to be, it has to be. So I'm thinking that, gee, you know, at 28 I'm a bishop and at 38 I'm a catechumen. And I thought, well, you have to do what you have to do. Oh, they'll make fun of you. You know something? When you decide to do something that you need to do, no matter how difficult it looks, God has a way to make it easier. Not only did they not make fun of me, 
but because I was willing to humble myself and start with baptism, they had more respect to me for that very thing. Whereas others had gone to Jordanville and um, they didn't get right away what they wanted and they left. Uh, Bishop Hilarion had first said, I said, well, how long will it take to go through the process? He said three days. It took three years. But that, that was fine. Um, I was ordained on the Mount of Olives. Uh, I was a tonsured reader and ordained subdeacon on the Mount of Olives the next year. In 95, I was made deacon in Jordanville by Vladik Hilarion, and in 96, uh, uh, ordained priest by Vladik Alaris. So I, w I was part of um, uh, Rokor. And before I was accepted, when Bishop Loris was going to come and visit to kind of inspect to see what was here. He came on a Sunday afternoon, and the night before, I had gotten a call from a Roman Catholic priest who said, you know, Father Damien, um, with your history with Archbishop Perfetta, do you, are you aware that the rumors have started that Rokor is, so, is again soon to reunite with Moscow? So when um, Bishop Hilarion had already visited here um, and now was uh, Archbishop Lars going to come. Having heard what I heard uh, about this, you know, this possible reunion, I received Ledica uh, Lars in the little church with the tray, with the cross and the bread, the wine and such. And, and um, he said a quick prayer, came into the trailer, and I said, Your Eminence, before we go any further, I have something I have to say. From what I know from my original jurisdiction and Archbishop Profeta, there is absolutely no way that I could ever have anything to do with the MP. Uh, so if you are going to join soon with Moscow. I withdraw my petition. You can have your cup of tea and go. Oh, and he smiled. No, we have no such plans, blah, 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 blah. Well, they were already talking. So he wasn't really being truthful with me. But he, he saw how I lived here. He respected my struggle. And at the time, I had a very ill dying monk here was a Ukrainian, um, and uh, we went through, I was received, I went through the baptism and everything. But I had made it clear from the beginning that I would never have anything to do with the MP. When they, when they started speaking of that, and it reached the point where it was becoming uh, true, um, Vladika Vitale broke away, and I broke away with him, and um, we formed a small little group. Um, Father Andrew Kensis, who is now with the GOC, uh, he, was, he was part of that, and a few other priests. Uh, it, it kind of disintegrated. Uh, and at that point, having already known Vladika Pavlos, um, I had visited him um, in um, Bearsville. He had visited me, and um, we had already managed to purchase this lower property. And he said, you know, Father Damien, you know, we love you. Why don't you come to us? One day I was in a very uh, um, difficult temptation. I called him and he came immediately and um, we dealt with what I had to deal with. And he says, Father Damien, come to us. So I said, I have to think about this. I can't just leave Vitale one, two, three like that. So I prayed and um, after several months, I became part of the GOC and have been part of that since. So um, I have no regrets of any of my decisions in life. It has been extremely difficult. It has been 
moments where you think it's impossible to go forward. And yet, uh, with one miracle of providence and another and another and another, um, after 40 years, I'm still here. And um, hope that this place continues when, I, when I'm gone. Um, there was, there was a one point um, where um, the neighbors who were still friends at the time, um, they thought I would become part of their occult group. And they were convinced that they could get me to join, and that, of course, never happened. But there was an, a very um, unscrupulous clergyman who became part of, of Profeta's leftover jurisdiction, and he wanted me to lose this property. So when we registered the property in the name of the church, he was supposed to, because he was a lawyer, do the paperwork for the exemptions of property tax and such, which he never did. But the tax bill went from the town to his office every year, was never paid, and I was never told. So the people in the farmhouse were, on a particular day, intending to go to Albany to do some errands. But something made them change their mind, and they were here. And all of a sudden, they noticed that there were people outside behind the barn taking pictures of the road, and they went out and they said, well, excuse us, but, you know, what's going on? Well, the taxes haven't been paid, and we are confiscating the 10 acres, and we're going to put it up to auction. Immediately, I was in the city at the time, I received a call, uh, and uh, because I had been working, cleaning, and whatever, I had money, you know, saved, and I... Um, uh, came up the next day and paid the taxes. Uh, this charlatan, who was no real orthodox person at all, um, his plans didn't go through and the land was saved. But it, it happens just in the nick of time. One day I'm going to work to clean the house of a Catholic priest in Catskill. Uh, he was the producer of Catholic programs uh, on television. And um, it's icy, it's uh, early spring, it's freezing rain. I'm fine with studded snow tires and four-wheel drive, but everybody else is skidding all over the place. And I didn't want to have an accident. So I said, no, just turn around, go another day, just go home. As I'm turning the car around and coming back, I'm thinking to myself, you know, this has happened before, that I was going to do such and such, and something changed. And so I was here because someone was meant to come knock on the door or a phone call. I wonder what will happen today. So I get back, and I'm, I'm uh, in my living room in front of the icons, and I'm, I'm praying a canon to the Mother of God, and the phone rings. So I answer it, and it's Father Damien, um, I am a Catholic priest interested in orthodoxy. May I come and visit your monastery? Well, of course, when you want to come, Father. Oh, in about an hour, he was visiting family close by. So he arrives, and it turns out he's a Monsignor, but he looks very young to be a Monsignor. Usually you are given this, this rank, if you will, uh, after many years of service in the church. So I said, aren't you young to be a Monsignor? I said, oh, Father, well, Monsignor, where is your parish? He said, well, I don't have a parish. I said, well, you must be in, um, have a special assignment. He says, yes. He says, I work for a German cardinal. Oh, uh, Cardinal Villebrand, who was a German cardinal that I knew of. He said, no, Cardinal Ratzinger. Cardinal Ratzinger was the future Pope Benedict VI. I had sitting across from me in my living room a Monsignor from the Vatican. And here I am, a former Roman Catholic, 
and he knew where and when I was baptized, where I went to grammar school, high school, college, that I taught. He knew my entire life story in every single detail. He knew the whole history of Archbishop Profeta. He knew how I became part of Rocor, that I broke away with Vitali, that I'm with the... He knew all of this. And, and as we got into the discussion, and I mentioned my brother having been in the Jesuit seminary and what he was taught, and Cardinal Ratzinger, before he became the Pope, his department was for the small orthodoxy of the faith. So if there was a, a new theologian who was getting carried away with himself and was going off you know, a doctrine, they would have to contact him and say, look, you know, get with the program. That's not Catholic. So, and he, would, he was telling me, he says, I have traveled in Russia and I have an icon on my computer in my office in the Vatican of Grand Duchess Elizabeth. And I tell all the other Monsignors here. Now, you go into a Catholic bookstore and you see about Buddha and Krishna and this and that. He says, you don't see that in, in an Orthodox bookstore. I said, you know, in the new calendar, who knows? But, uh, so he was really uh, hurting seeing in his beloved church this terrible apostasy um, from the faith. And we're talking about this and about even the book of Catholic prophecy where at that point, according to this book of Catholic prophecy, um, and I can't remember offhand which, uh, which prophet saint of the Roman church said that there was going to be basically one more pope and then the next one after that was going to be Peter II. Well, the next one was his boss Ratzinger, who came, became Pope Benedict VI. And according to the prophecy, the next one was going to be Peter II, which didn't happen. It's this, it's this present Pope, Francis. But um, it's, it's just, um, it's incredible how, as difficult it has been through all the years, and, you know, when you are raised in a Catholic family and you leave the Pope, had I gone into a Roman Catholic uh, monastic house, the, the, the whole extended family would have been very generous to, to wherever I had gone. But because I became non-Catholic, uh, they, you know, I basically kind of lost most of my family. And... Um, but you, you have to be willing to give up everything for that pearl of great price, which is the truth of orthodoxy. And as hard as it has been, as hard as the struggle has been, when, when the f people in the farmhouse realized I wouldn't accept their heretical teachings, they started a campaign to get rid of me. Um, that's why it took from 83 to... Uh, to um, the end of 90 to even have um, uh, a road or utilities. And I had to bring them to court uh, twice. And it, it was a very, very difficult thing. And having won the court case uh, where I, I could have not only a road, but that they would have to permit the utility company to put a line wherever they saw that it would would be the proper place to put it. Um, the electric company came to me and said, Father Damon, we hate to tell you this, but from what we can see, we have to go over their property and over your property and such and such and so and so. You will have to put in a, what we would call a, a private line and by law, you must have a $1 million liability insurance. Well, there was no way that I could afford such a thing. So what do I do? The people who are at the time trustees were telling me, because the people wanted to buy the land back, so everyone was telling me, you fought a good fight, 
take the money and go someplace else. Well, I had to, I had to really pray over this whole thing. Can I live the rest of my life without utilities? Uh, carrying food and water and fuel from almost a mile away up? Uh, how am I going to do it? Well, I made a decision because of all the miracles of providence and one of the beginning miracles. Even before I say this, I have to say, there have been miracles of providence and healing in my life. And it is not because I am anything special. The more you pray, the more you realize what a sinner you are. Because you're not comparing yourself to another human. You're comparing yourself to that perfection which is God who is love. Before this all came about up here, I already had land, but I was still in the city in a temporary place. I was doing Vespers. I came through the north door. I was alone, and I was chanting the dogmatique and looking at the icon of the Mother of God. And never having expected anything like this, there was no vision, but she spoke. The monastery in the mountains will not be for the holy angels. It will be for me and for my domitian. I was in a state of shock. I had never, I would never even think to have such an experience. And I stood there completely unable to move, unable to do anything. And finally, I came to myself and I said, Holy Mother, my mother always told me, never argue with a woman, and I'm certainly not going to argue with the Holy Mother of God. You want it, you got it. There were two other instances where she spoke. But at that point, remembering the Mother of God chose this place and specifically for her domitian, which I could never understand why specifically for that. I'm very thick-headed, slow learner. But reading about various places of the domitian, and it's like, well, you stupid idiot. That was the crowning glory of her life, right? When she was taken by her divine son bodily into paradise after dying. And we are all supposed to use her, you know, to imitate her in her humility and such. And we are all, even lay people in the Orthodox faith, we are to daily die to this world to live for the next. So that's why, that's, it's what it's all about, because it's the Dormition. You must die to this earth for paradise. You have to let go here. So when I thought about all this, I finally made the decision. I don't care. I will not leave here. If I have to live without utilities, I'm not going anywhere. Well, I had a meeting with the electric company in Oneonta, and I had two documents in the whole legal procedures with the neighbor. Uh, first, the town um, clerk had written a letter to them saying that, you know, there's no, you know, no part of Parker Street has ever been abandoned, you know. And um, she, they didn't accept that. So the whole town board signed a paper that, you know, no part of Parker Street has ever been abandoned. They were claiming that it wasn't used, and because they had land on both sides, it had gone back and become actually their property, the road itself. So I had these papers. I, something told me to bring these papers with me. So we went to Oneonta, a friend of mine, uh, and we, we, we sat before them, and I said, I don't know what can be done. There's no that I can afford a million dollar policy. 
local local insurance agencies don't even know what to quote or, or whatever. And I, I just can't do it. I don't know, but do these two papers have anything to say to you to mitigate things? When they look at these two papers, Father Damien, that's still a public easement. We thought it was your private road. We, you don't need a private thing with a million dollars. All you have to do is pay for one poll, that's $1,100, we will pay you one dollar for the easement to put the line across your land. It'll cost you $1,100 plus one dollar and you got it. And we take care of the line. Now, suppose I had given up, taken money from them and gone somewhere else. This place wouldn't even be here now. But I, I had to pass the test to be determined to live without utilities for the rest of my miserable life. I had to make that decision before God changed the situation. I mean, the road was already known to be, um, you know, not abandoned, but, you know, I didn't, I didn't know or understand all this stuff. So, but I had to pass the test to make that decision. So, if I have learned anything in these 40 years to tell you people of the next generation, choose what is the right thing to do. We go back to that, I kept my word to that nun, which got me teaching religion, and all of the decisions along, the, all of the consequences that came from that decision are totally different if I had gone to a secular public school. So all of the decisions that I've had to make here, it's been one test and another and another, and that's what life is. So I can get uh, um, upset and perhaps even depressed that things haven't developed that I thought were developed, but that's not, it's the beginning of whatever is to come. And that's in God's hands and, and the hands of his Holy Mother. So I, from day to day, I mean, I'm in some part of the last chapter of my life. And um, I don't know how much time I have. I have a number of health issues, none of which are presently, you know, going to be fatal. But it's to pray your prayers every day. You have to put your whole heart and soul in it. And you, you, you have to force yourself to think. as the, Everything that the fathers have said and put in writing, when you, when you struggle in the faith, in, in the monastic life, or even as an orthodox lay person, everything written is 1,000% true everything and your own personal experience proves that it's all true when you follow what they say that you ha how you have to live your life so uh it's you have to live each day as if it could be your last and just keep going from day to day and if this doesn't work and that doesn't work it's not up to you i'm now praying holy mother if i'm in the way then ask your son to take me let them dig the hole and put me six feet under. I don't care. Just let this continue. And if I'm not to die right now, then just give me the strength to keep on going and never, ever, ever give up. As much as I've seen and experienced miracles, a few from St. John and whatever, I, I used to be the world's worst worrier. I think maybe I'm now only the second or the third. But we are tempted, even when you see miracles in front of your eyes and you've had them happen to you, you are still tempted. The devil doesn't run out of ways to get you. He's been around a heck of a lot longer than we have been. And so if you overcome one weakness, well, then there's always this to get you or whatever. There's, no matter who you are, no matter how you pray, even the saints themselves were tempted, you know, and it's not over until you breathe your last breath. So until you get into the gates, it isn't done, it isn't over. 
And so people who have come here and who have been helped, uh, a, a lot of people of, of my own generation that, that you know um, uh, from Ascension or Owego and Parish and such, um, uh, we know that we don't have much time. And we're looking to your generation to carry, the, to carry this on. And so if by telling the stories of my experience can give someone encouragement to go on, even when things look impossible and hopeless, what is God's will will take place. It doesn't happen when and how you want it. It's in his hands, and you have to learn to let it go in his hands. When you have been a person to be the doer, that you see something that needs doing, and you do it, and you plan, you get a plan, and you execute a plan. When you've been a hard worker all your life, the nuns used to say there are two kinds of people, the workers and the shirkers. Well, I've always been a worker, never a shirker. But then there's the negative side of the shirker, because then you get to think it's all on you to get it done. And you kind of forget that it's really up to God to begin with. So you just have to be grateful for what you have suffered through by God's grace. And whatever is meant to be will come about. And, you know, Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And the thing that we have to realize and really, really try to understand is... As St. John says, God is love. There is faith, hope, and love, and the greatest is love, because love encompasses everything. And only in my later years is there more and more of a comprehension that that's what it's all about. Before God even created, the, made the angels, the God had existed in that perfect love, which the world doesn't understand what it is even. Their idea of love is totally different. But after creation, after all the ages have ended, after we come to the point where Christ comes to judge the living and the dead, all saved souls in paradise will spend an eternity with God by grace, living within their souls and resurrected bodies. We will be experience, we will be experiencing that perfect love who is God. It's not a thing. Everything began from love from God. And everything goes back to that love, which is God. The next, I've, I've heard that the mystery of the next age is silence. I, I'm beginning to understand that. I've known elderly couples who have been married for 50 and 60 years. And maybe in the beginning of their courtship, Oh, they spoke about their dreams and hopes and everything and whatever. But then as time goes by, you've said everything there has to say. There reaches a point where there is no need to say anything. To just be in the presence of the person that you love is enough. He can be reading the paper. She's knitting whatever, doing something. And there's not a word being spoken. But there is this love between them that doesn't need any words at all. And perhaps when they say that the mystery of the next age is silence, then perhaps it is that all that is in existence is that perfect love who is God.